Greetings. Uh, my name is Ezra. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Riverside and uh, so excited to be able to bring the word from Mark chapter 2 for you today. So you can go ahead and turn there in your Bible. Uh, we will have the scripture on the screen for you as well. But uh, we're going to be looking at the big picture idea today that Jesus uh, can give us everything that we need, everything that we truly need. Jesus can give that to us. And that may sound like a, a simple concept or maybe it sounds like just a vague concept, but we're going to see in three really clear ways in this passage how Jesus gives us exactly what we need, whether we realize it or not. Uh, so I'm excited. Uh, let's say a word of prayer, and then we'll just dive into the word. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. It has power to change our lives. We thank you that you give us everything that we need. Help us to see that clearly in your word today, and help us to humbly come uh, to your feet uh, in, in acceptance and appreciation of what you have done for us. Uh, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, and so let's begin. Uh, we're going to jump into Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Uh, it says this. It says, When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. He was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, or rise, take your bed, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Uh, this first encounter is, is amazing, and uh, it's an incredible story, right? Jesus is preaching. It's, it's beyond standing room only. People can't even crowd in the door. They're out in the streets just trying to, to hear a little bit of what Jesus is saying, and along come these four men with their paralyzed friend, and they can't get in the house, and so they go up on the roof, and they literally rip the roof off the joint, right? It gives a new meaning to the expression, raise the roof. And they, they rip the roof off, sorry for the bad dad joke, right? Uh, but they, uh, they rip the roof off and they, and they drop it in. And, you know, side note, uh, this is part of why we're encouraging people to jump into these discipleship groups of the three to five. There's times when you just need, you know, two, three, four friends who are gonna come along and they're going to take you to Jesus, right? They're, they're gonna make a way. They're gonna rip the roof off if they have to. Uh, to get you to a place where you can receive the healing that Jesus can offer to you. And, uh, man, there's, there's so much value. He had four good friends who were willing to do that for him. And, and we want you to have those same kind of people, right? So that's just a, a sidebar to the importance of, of these sort of relationships. But they, they break the roof open. Now, you might think when Jesus said, hey, your sins are forgiven, he was talking about the sin of destroying that property, right? Of, of destroying that person's roof. But I don't think that's what Jesus was getting at here. Uh, Jesus wanted to use this moment um, to teach something. But, but I think it's important to, to note the distinction. Jesus never uh, uses people for his agenda. He wasn't using this man uh, to make a point. He had something specific he wanted to do to, to bring healing to this man. And he, and he also used it as an opportunity to show a lesson to the people that were there. Uh, and so he asked them the question. He, after he says, your sins are forgiven, he knows the thoughts of their heart. And he says, hey, which one's easier uh, to, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? Uh, it's kind of a trick question, right? Because it's easier to say sins are forgiven because nobody can really see that. It's not something you can observe. So it's easier to say, but it's actually much harder to forgive sins. No one can forgive sins but God himself. And so Jesus says, hey, in order to prove to you that you can, I can do what you can't see, I'll do what you can see. And he told the man to get up, and the man got up, and he was healed. Uh, now, this whole story encapsulates uh, the first type that I want you to understand in, in, the, in understanding that Jesus provides everything that we truly need. And this is the type where you think you want and need one thing, but Jesus shows that you, that you have a much deeper need for something else. Uh, this paralyzed man, 
we don't know how long he'd been paralyzed. Was it an accident? Had he been born that way? It was, uh, we, we aren't given those details. Uh, but here's what we do know. If you know somebody who's, who's experienced that sort of hardship, that, that sort of difficulty, it's very easy to drop into despair. It's, all, it's easy to drop into bitterness. It's, it's easy to drop into envy and jealousy of others who, who maybe don't have to experience and go through life with the same difficulties that you go through. And so there was certainly an opportunity for his heart to be hardened, uh, for him to struggle, for him to sin. Uh, and, uh, and Jesus wanted him to know, hey, uh, I know you want to walk. And you think that if you walk, everything will be perfect in your life. But, um, but, but all the people in this room can walk, and I can tell you that their lives aren't perfect. Right? And so, yes, Jesus did ultimately heal him and enable him to walk. But he said, hey, your need actually goes need deeper than just to be healed of your paralysis. What you really need is the forgiveness of sins, a restored relationship with your, with your creator. The same thing is true for many of us. We come to church, uh, we come to Jesus, we come to a relationship with God because we have a need in our life. Maybe it's a financial need, we're in a desperate situation financially. Maybe it's a relational need, there's a broken relationship, or we just desire, Lord, when are you going to bring that right person along? Uh, for me. Uh, maybe it's a physical need like this man had where, where we need healing uh, from Jesus. And it's good. We should come to him with those needs. Uh, people do that all throughout the Bible. and Jesus always honors that. Uh, but maybe what he's trying to show you this morning is that your need actually goes way deeper than what you realize. He could give you the desire of your heart, but that might not solve uh, the deepest problems that you have. But if you have forgiveness of sins... If you have a restored relationship with your creator, God, that's the access point to true peace in your life. That, that gives you the certainty in your identity, the hope that you need to actually live a life of, of fulfillment. And, uh, and so Jesus says, hey, I know you want momentary peace, but I want to give you lasting peace. And so, so I pray that maybe that's a word for, for someone listening today, that, uh, that you're coming and you're so aware of your immediate crisis or need. Jesus wants you to see today that he can give you actually something that's much deeper than that. So we begin there with the, with the man who thought he knew what he wanted, but he actually needed something else. The next story that we're going to see unfold in Mark chapter 2 is of a man who came to realize that all the things that he had tried to pursue, uh, that, that, that he couldn't get the answer, that they didn't satisfy. He got the things that he wanted, that he thought would bring him happiness, and found out that they fell short. And so he was looking for something true, and he finds it in Jesus. It's the story of Levi, and it picks up in verse 13. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him. He was teaching them, and as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, uh, sitting at the tax booth. He said to him, follow me. And he rose, and he followed him. And as he reclined at table at his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. The scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. It's an powerful encounter with Levi, and we aren't given a lot of the details, right? We, we don't know what was going through Levi's mind in that moment. There's this temptation to read it and, and just hear Jesus walking up out of the blue and saying, hey, you, follow me, and, and, and getting up and going. But, but clearly there was something more going on under the service. Uh, a tax collector in that time was someone, Levi was a Hebrew, he was an Israelite, and yet he had betrayed his people by becoming an ally of the Roman Empire. He was collecting taxes uh, for the enemy. And therefore, he was despised by his people. And this is a guy named Levi. He bears the name of one of the 12 patriarchs uh, of, of, of the nation of Israel, right? Uh, and yet, he's betrayed his people for the sake of, of pursuing monetary gain. A tax collector could become very wealthy because they were charged with the Roman Empire of collecting a tax, but they could actually charge a higher amount and keep the, the additional amount for themselves. And so many of them uh, stocked up great wealth. And so perhaps Levi was uh, uh, allured by this, that, hey, this is a way for me to gain meaning in my life. I can sacrifice some relationships. I can, I can betray my kinspeople. But if I get wealth, then I'll be important. Then I'll have purpose. Then my life will have meaning. I'll have everything that I want. But clearly, it had left him short. He didn't find what he needed. 
And so when he saw Jesus, whether he had heard the words and the message of Jesus or he merely looked into the eyes of Jesus, he suddenly recognized that everything he had been looking for in all these other ways, he found in Jesus. Maybe that's a reflection of your story. Maybe, maybe you've been pursuing meaning and purpose and hope in so many things, whether it's wealth, whether it's reputation, whether it's a, a job or a career, whether it's relationships, whether it's through lust, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's by being a, 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 a champion for a cause uh, that, you, that you want to, uh, to, to see justice and change happen. And those, all those things in the right place could potentially be good, but none of them will bring you lasting meaning and purpose, and they always end up leaving you empty. And in fact, one of the most uh, difficult places to be is when you attain everything that you thought you ever wanted, and you stand there, and you realize that it didn't make you happy. It didn't bring you joy. Uh, Jesus doesn't want us to keep pursuing those things. And if we think about it in our, in our society, in our culture, that's what we idolize. We, we, we look to people that are famous, that are wealthy, that are beautiful. They have all the things that we think that we want, that we think will make us happy, but ultimately, uh, many of those people are, are just as uh, unhappy in life or dissatisfied or lacking in purpose and meaning uh, as those who have far less. It's not the answer. And, and Levi recognizes that when he sees Jesus. And look at the result of that. When you get to the point where you realize that's not going to bring me happiness and only Jesus truly can, he throws a party. He invites Jesus and he invites all of his unsaved friends and they come and they hear the words of Jesus and, and perhaps some of those were changed and some of them became followers of Jesus as well. And the story doesn't end there because Levi, we know actually, is renamed Matthew and becomes one of Jesus' followers, one of the disciples, and an author of one of the Gospels, one of the four accounts of Jesus' life that we have. And so it's incredible to see the transformation that happened in that man. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you've attained some success in life, or maybe you're desperately pursuing it. Uh, maybe you think, if I just get this, I'll be satisfied. And maybe what God's trying to say through this passage to you today is, I'm the only one who can give you everything that you truly need. I'm the only one who can really bring you lasting joy and peace and purpose and hope. It's in me and no one else, in nothing else. Maybe he's calling you to lay that down today and to follow him. And, and if that's your day, just think about what God could do through your life in the same way that he did it through the life of Matthew. And so we've seen two accounts. We've seen the paralytic and, and how he thought he, he had what he needed. He thought he knew what he needed, but it turned out Jesus said, no, you need something actually far deeper than that. We look at Levi who who thought um, that he could find uh, what he needed in other ways and found them lacking and then found true purpose in Jesus. And so we'd expect the third to be a similar account of someone finding ultimate purpose in Jesus. But sadly, we find out what happens when people continue to harden their heart and push Jesus away. Let's look at the third passage. It says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. People came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins. The wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. On Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. After these two positive encounters, we see weaved throughout this story in Mark 2, this negative encounter that he has with the Pharisees. The Pharisees don't believe that Jesus has everything that they need. In fact, they want nothing to do with Jesus. All that they want from Jesus is for Jesus to go away and to leave them alone. Stop speaking, stop, stop talking, uh, just, just to disappear. That's what they desire most. And so there's this incredible irony, right, that 
um, that there was this time of fasting. The disciples of John are fasting. Their disciples are fasting. And they said, Jesus, why aren't your disciples fasting? Uh, and Jesus says, hey, I'm here with them. The point of fasting is, is to have a time when you set aside, you with go, or you go without certain things so that you can draw closer to God and hear from him more clearly. Well, here, the disciples are sitting at the feet of Jesus, eating with him, spending time with him, hearing his word. They don't need to fast to get closer to God because they are literally in his presence. Now, ironically, the Pharisees at the same time are fasting, saying, Lord, reveal yourself to us. Let us draw closer to you. Let us see who you are. And then they walk over and they speak to Jesus, who is everything that they've been praying for. And they say, hey, what are you doing? You're not doing it right. Uh, There's an incredible irony in that, right? We see also in the story in the account of the Sabbath that um, during the Sabbath, you weren't to do work. Uh, But the point of the Sabbath is to recognize that um, you're dependent on God, that you can work for six days and on the seventh day you can rest and God will provide for your needs. And so here are the disciples walking through this field and, and essentially, it's this beautiful picture of God providing for their needs. There's the ground that God made. There's the plants that God created that he calls them to grow. There's the grain that is, that is grown by the, the power of God. And they're taking it and they're saying, thank you, Lord, for providing this for us. We're hungry. We don't have anything stored up for ourselves. And it's a picture of what the Sabbath is really meant to represent. And yet the Pharisees were mad because they said they were working by plucking grain. Now, certainly if the disciples have been plucking grain and taking it and selling it or or storing up a bunch uh, for months to come, that would have been uh, a dishonoring of the Sabbath. But as they were doing it, it was actually a very beautiful application of what Sabbath is meant to mean. And, and, And they couldn't see it. The Pharisees were so blinded, they wanted nothing from Jesus. Now, you can come with wrong intentions. Uh, You can go after things in the wrong way. Uh, But the one thing that will keep you from receiving exactly what you need from Jesus is a hardened heart that says, I don't need anything from Jesus. I can do it myself. That's the whole point uh, of what the Bible says in in Ephesians chapter 2, where it says, uh, salvation is by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one would boast. We can't earn our salvation. The Pharisees, through, through the keeping of the law, through these re- religious rituals and practices were trying to make themselves holy. They were pursuing a self-righteousness. And that's why Jesus was so constantly opposed to them because he said, what you're trying to do, uh, not only will you never accomplish what you're trying to do, but it also is going to keep you from ever coming to me to receive from me what only I can give to you. Friends, my hope and my prayer is that that, that is not your heart today, but if it is, I, I, I pray that you would be um, convicted, that you would acknowledge it, that you would be willing to to freshly evaluate and allow Jesus to give you what only he can give you. We're in a moment in our our culture where this is happening uh, in large scale, and I want to take just a moment to think about some of the, as we conclude, some of the ways to apply some of these things. And um, Much like the Pharisees, uh, there, there are some of us who have become more and more aware in recent weeks of of that we've turned a blind eye to to some of the injustices that have been going on for a long time in our country, in our culture, in our world. And the question for each person that's in that situation is to say, hey, what am I going to do about that? Am I going to harden my heart? Am I going to double down? Am I going to say, hey, no, I I don't have any, uh, I'm not not racist, (laughs) and so therefore it's not my problem. Or are we going to honestly evaluate and say, hey, if I, if I really am not racist and I really care about all people and I know that there is injustice that's being put on display before me, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to change my behavior to be a part of the solution? Um, and, and I think this is a moment where um, this, this, the Pharisees were so hardened into their positions and, um, and today sometimes we get so hardened into political ideologies or, or methodologies of how we think to solve the problem and we just need to begin with an empathy. We just need to begin in a place of saying, Lord, if there's something not right in my heart, if my heart isn't aligned with yours, let's begin there, Lord. Align my heart with you. And we can look at solutions, and we can look at ways of, of getting um, to, the, to, to a better future, uh, a future that looks more like your kingdom. But let me begin by just looking at my own heart. And if you're not willing to do that, um, then, then I, would, I, would, I would encourage you to deeply think about whether you're positioning yourself much like the Pharisees where they were unwilling to change. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're somebody who's experienced um, 
uh, discrimination, hatred, oppression. If, if someone has treated you uh, poorly simply because of, of the color of your skin or where you grew up, I want to encourage you that um, this world, we're, we're seeking to make it a better place, but until Jesus returns because of depravity in, in, in every human's heart, this world will never be a perfect place. And so if you're placing your hope for ultimate joy and, and hope and fulfillment in seeing the entire world changed, you're ultimately setting yourself up for disappointment. And so we have to begin in that moment, if that's where you're at, you have to begin by saying, Jesus, I'm going to come to you to give me only what, what you can give me. And, and, and say, I'm going to take my identity, I'm going to take my purpose, I'm going to take my joy from you, because I know how you look at me and how you love me, and that's going to be the center that I begin with. And then I'm going to work out from there to pursue justice, to pursue peace, uh, to see hearts and minds changed. Uh, but, but I'm going to begin at a place of centered joy in you. And friends, that, that's only possible with a relationship with Jesus. That's only possible if you've experienced the forgiveness of sins that only he can offer. That's the only way that you can have that peace at the center of your heart in the midst of the storm. That's the kind of people that we need to be as a church. There's so much work for the opportunity uh, for, for us as Christians to do right now, but we have to be willing to step into it. We have to be willing to embrace it, and we have to uh, make sure that it's anchored and centered in a relationship with Jesus Christ, to have the heart and the empathy of Jesus Christ. That's how we move forward. Uh, friends, I, I, hope that, um, I hope that you came into this with an understanding that, that only Jesus can give you what you need. I hope that's what you understood before we even began to, to, walk, to, to explore Mark 2. And, and if so, I hope that today was just a reminder of that, a reminder to continue, uh, because we can get distracted so easily. As soon as the next iPhone product comes out, as soon as, as the next toy that we didn't know that we needed, as soon as uh, the next vacation spot opens up, as soon as corona ends and then vacation travel and, and uh, all those things that have kind of been put on hold, as soon as that opens up, it will be very easy to be distracted. Um, and, and, and so I hope this is a moment where we can all continue to just recenter and really put our roots down deep into God's word to carry us forward. Um, but I just want to encourage you, if, if you're hearing this, and, and this is either for the first time or, or a reawakening for you to the power of Jesus, I just want to tell you that um, you can put your faith in him today, that he can offer you that forgiveness of sins today. And you do that by saying a simple prayer. And I'm just going to give you a chance to do that right now. Um, and so if you'll repeat after me, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, if you're ready to enter into that forgiveness that he's offering, if you're saying, just like Levi sitting in the tax booth, yes, I want that. That's what I need. I've tried to find it other places. I know that that's where it is. I know I can't find it anywhere but Jesus. I'm ready. I want to do it. Here's what you do. Just join me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent Jesus to die in my place. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that only Jesus can give me what I truly need. I repent of my sin. I know that I've been going in the wrong direction. I pray that you would forgive me. And I receive that forgiveness with great joy. Teach me to follow you. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, I would just ask you to, to send me an email. Just let me know. Let me celebrate with you. Um, uh, let me... Uh, begin to walk with you. We can connect you with some people over here at Riverside, uh, just kind of to point you in the right direction. Uh, you need those friends around you that, that can carry you in moments when you need to be carried, and, and that's what the church is. Uh, friends, I'm so grateful. I'm excited to continue in the journey of Mark that, that we've begun. I pray that you'll have a blessed week. Uh, take care.